the resurrection is not one of, but the most momentous moment in history. In history. Um, and there are many moments in the resurrection uh, that I love. I love it, itself, but, but everything that surrounds it, I love as well. And, and one of my favorite moments that surround the resurrection are the first words of Jesus when he rose again. The first words he spoke to someone, to Mary, in fact, when he rose again. And those words are in Matthew 28. Now just listen to these. These are amazing. Just listen, and you'll see it on the screen as well. The woman, Mary, ran from the tomb, badly frightened. She was afraid, but she was also filled with joy and rushed to find the followers of Jesus to give them the angel's message. And as they were running, suddenly Jesus was there in front of them. The last time she saw him, he was hanging on a cross and then he was buried in a grave. She runs to the grave and it's empty. And now as she runs back to tell everyone the grave is empty, she sees Jesus. Now listen to the first words he says. Okay, this is Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, the creator of the universe. He has just conquered sin, Satan, and the grave. Conquered it. And these are his first words. Morning. That's what he says. Good morning. Good morning. And they fell to the ground before him, holding his feet and worshipping him. I love that. I love that his first words are good morning. Jesus is so relaxed. He's so unsurprised, unshocked at what has happened. And he's like that because the resurrection did not shock Jesus at all. He knew the resurrection would happen. In, in, in fact, several years after it happened, Paul, the uh, apostle of Jesus, wrote these words about the resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 4, he says, Christ was raised on day three, on the third day, in accordance with the scriptures. What does that mean? It means this. Our God is the author of this very book. He wrote it all. And in it are predictions and plans and prophecies that the resurrection would happen. He told us it would happen. And he didn't just tell us that the resurrection would happen a few hours or a few weeks or a few months before it happened. He told us it would happen thousands of years before it happened. Thousands of years before it happened. And that's what I want to speak to you about this morning. Now, if it's your first time here or you haven't been with us for a few weeks um, in this church, we're currently in a series, which means we are preaching um, some sermons in a series. And we're looking at the seven feasts or festivals of Israel. Um, all of these seven feasts point to Jesus and they point to him and foreshadow him and show him 1600 years before he came to earth. Now so far we have studied two of them, Passover, which foreshadowed the crucifixion of Jesus. And then on Friday we looked at unleavened bread, which foreshadowed, pointed us to the burial of Christ. So that he was crucified on Friday, buried in the grave on Saturday. And this morning, I want us to go on a journey in the third feast of Israel, the feast of first fruits, which foreshadows and points, as you can imagine, to the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what that means for us. Now, the feast of first fruits is spoken about primarily in Leviticus 23 verses 9 to 14 and so if you've got your Bibles with you you can turn there if not you can follow along with what you see on the screen or you can listen to me and in Leviticus 23 verses 9 to 14 this is what it says about the feast of first 
fruits. It says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, who was the leader of Israel at that period. And God spoke to him, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I, I give to you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf of crops of first fruits before the Lord, so that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, which was a Saturday, so the day after that, on a Sunday, the priest shall wave it. Now, Israel was an agricultural society, and the feast of first fruits was the starting point of the of the barley harvest the barley harvest the feast and the harvest began on a sunday the first day of the week after passover after unleavened bread on that sunday morning the priest would take the crops the first and the finest of the crops of the harvest and he would tie it up and he would wave it left to right in the presence of our god seeking the Lord's acceptance of the harvest. And it continues in verse 12, And on the day you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb a year old without blemish as a burnt offering to the Lord, and the grain offering with it shall be two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, a food offering to the Lord with a pleasing aroma, and the drink offering with it shall be a wine, a fourth of a hymn. And you shall eat neither bread nor grain, parched or fresh, until this same very day the day until you brought the offering of your of of your god it is a statute forever it is a law forever throughout your generations in all the places that you live now what that means is that the truths and the lessons contained in the feast of first fruits are for every generation of god's people so that's us that's us. Though it is thousands of years after the, fir- uh, the feast was inaugurated, the truths and the lessons contained in it are for us. And so this morning, I want to show you two truths contained in it and two lessons revealed in it. Two truths contained in it and two lessons revealed in it. And the first truth is this. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of the feast of first fruits. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of first fruits. The feast thousands of years ago was the shadow pointing to the reality which is found in Jesus. The Bible makes this very, very clear. In 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20, the uh, the apostle Paul says this, but in fact... Christ is being raised from the dead. Hallelujah. The first fruits, and you can underline that, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. All the seven feasts of Israel of the Lord are prophetic dress rehearsals of future events involving Jesus. And the Apostle Paul says that the first fruits, the feast of first fruits, prophetically rehearses, foreshadows, points to, shows us the resurrection of Jesus Christ 1,600 years before it actually happened. He is the first fruits of the new resurrection harvest. What does that mean, Pastor Will? I'll explain. When you farm, the first fruits are always the basis for the quality of the rest of the harvest. They are the representative of what the rest of your crops are like. So if the first fruits are bad or or very good, then that tells everyone that the rest of your harvest is either bad or very good. So when the priests waved them before our God, their acceptance or rejection by him was the acceptance or the rejection of the entire harvest. So if God was happy 
with the crops, with the first ones, the first and the finest, then the rest of the harvest he was happy with as well. And they could harvest it and they could eat it. But if he was not happy, then it all got to be destroyed. So taking this idea in the context of that, the Bible calls Jesus the first fruits of the resurrection. The first fruits of the resurrection. And if you're still not there, why? I'll tell you. Because Jesus was the first to be resurrected to new life, to never die again. Resurrected to new life. And this is the key, to never die again. Because before Jesus, other people had been resurrected to life. But each person that had been resurrected to life was resurrected back into their mortal, physical, still sin-affected selves, still to face weakness and sickness and the grave. And Lazarus, he's a famous one. He was, he, he was just resurrected into the back same old self that he was before he passed away. And so he would have faced the grave again, but not Jesus. Jesus' resurrection was something new, something fresh, something that had never been seen or happened before because he gloriously rose never to die again. And that term, first, 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 that term that we keep saying and echoing, that, or that term this morning is key because the term first supposes that there will be a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, and on and on and on and on. The first fruits supposes that there will be a harvest, that there will be other crops after it. And that's, that's absolutely right. Friends, Jesus, this is why the resurrection is so amazing and so personal, because, because Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection, because after him, there will be a second, a third, and a fourth, and on and on, because there will be a harvest of people that will be gloriously resurrected to wait for it. New, perfect, sinless, strong, and eternal life, never to die again. And the Bible says those people, that harvest after him, are all the followers of of Jesus Christ. So if you are a follower of Jesus, then Paul is talking about you when he said that you are the one who falls asleep because death is not your end. Because one day when Christ returns, you're going to wake up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus is our representative, our stamp of approval that we are accepted by God and one day he will physically rise us from the grave forever with him in glory. So that is truth number one. That's truth number one. Jesus is the fulfillment of first fruits. He's the ultimate first fruit. And then the second truth is this. First fruits shows us that the resurrection was not by accident. The resurrection was not by accident. Christ was not crucified and then his father in heaven went, oh no, I didn't expect that. I need to rise him back up into life. No, 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 no. The resurrection was not by accident. You remember earlier on, I told you that Jesus was not shocked. His first words, morning, he was not shocked. He already knew the resurrection would happen. Why? Because the Bible told him so. It happened according to the scriptures. None of it was by accident. And in fact, specifically, when he was resurrected was not a shock to him. And the fact that he was the one who was resurrected was not a shock to him. Jesus was resurrected on the first day of the week. Not a shock. And Jesus was the person who was resurrected to new life, never to die again. Not a shock, because the scriptures told him so. It's no accident that Jesus was raised to life on a Sunday, the first day of the week. The Feast of First Fruits was on a Sunday, the first day of the week. God had planned all of this. In fact, long ago, even before time, the Bible tells us that God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Spirit planned to send the Son, Jesus, to rescue us from sin, hell, and evil through his crucifixion and resurrection. None of it was a shock. All of it was planned. And in that plan, in that plan was the exact day of the week everything 
would happen. God is meticulous in his planning of Jesus' life and of yours. God is meticulous in his planning. And not only does the Feast of First Fruits reveal that Jesus would be resurrected on a Sunday, but there's in fact, and you're going to love this, there's in fact a whole prophetic a pattern found throughout Scripture which reveals to us the importance of a Sunday and that Jesus would be risen on that very day. I'll show you. It'll be on the screen. Uh, uh, um, Noah's Ark. Noah and his ark came up out of the waters of the flood and found peace and rested on earth, bringing new life for Noah, his family, and everyone who came after him. Uh, That is a prophetic picture of the resurrection and it happened when on the first day of the week israel were enslaved by egypt for 400 years they came out of slavery on a friday chased by their enemies they went through the red sea they then emerged out of that red sea victorious over their enemies and free from slavery and that victory happened on a sunday they went from death to to life on the first day of the week And then Israel, as they were going to the promised land, they were in the wilderness for 40 years. And as they were, they became very hungry and they moaned and they groaned, but God was merciful and he provided bread from heaven to them. And then when Israel got to the edge of the promised land, the provision of bread ended on a Saturday. And then they began to feast on the fruits and the foods of the promised land, never to eat that manna, that bread from heaven ever again because now they had food in abundance forevermore when did that first eating happen on a sunday on a sunday they went from lacking to abundance on the first day of the week now one more just last one the jews who were under threat of annihilation because of haman this evil man haman who wanted to annihilate every jewish person in the world until queen esther who was a Jew herself, but was the queen of Persia, until she intervened, and she called a fast for three, for three days. It began on a Friday, continued on a Saturday, and then ended on a Sunday. And then on the Sunday, she courageously entered the courts of the king while under threat of execution herself. And she stood up for her people, and she saved Israel. And Haman was executed in their place. And God's people went from death to life when? On the first day of the week, a Sunday. Throughout the Bible, there is this prophetic pattern of the first day of the week. But there's even more, because to make it even more amazing, all those events I just mentioned happen on the 17th of the first month of the calendar of Israel. The 17th of the first month of the, of the calendar of Israel. Every event I just mentioned, which was the exact same day of the year as first fruits and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. My friends, this is not a coincidence. God is sovereign and he's in charge of every minute, moment, and hour of every day. Hundreds and thousands of years separated those events I just mentioned to you, but God's plan was clear. Jesus would be resurrected on a Sunday, the 17th of the first month of the year, and he was. So no wonder Jesus woke up on Sunday morning and he wasn't shocked. He knew his Bible. He knew his God was faithful. He also wouldn't have been surprised that it was him, that it was he who was resurrected because uh, he would not have been shocked that he was the first fruit of the resurrection. For who else could it have been but him? Who else could have been the representative of a new glorified perfect humanity that would rule and reign on the earth? It could be no one. It could only be Jesus The Bible tells us that Jesus is the firstborn of Mary. Jesus is the first and only son of God the Father. And then it also says he's the firstborn of creation. And then it also says he's the firstborn of many new brothers and sisters. Jesus is the first. 
He's the first we run to for help. He's the first we run to for provision. The first we run to for healing. The first that loves us. The first that holds us. The first that leads us. Uh, the first that cares for us. He's the first and the last. The Alpha and the Omega. And then Colossians most wonderfully says that he is the preeminent one. The supreme one. The greatest of the greats. The best of the best. That's Jesus. So who else could it have been? He is the first fruit, the firstborn of the dead, because he alone is the first and the finest of all that exists. He is our God's very best. In the, first, uh, in the feast of first fruits, Israel relied. They relied on God to provide the harvest, to provide the sun and the rain and the seed. They were experiencing God's love expressed to them through crops and through cows. But 1,600 years later, friends, how a God would express his love in a far greater provision, in a far greater way than through crops and cows. Because 1,600 years later, he would provide for us his son, his perfect and eternal son. In Jesus, just think about this, in Jesus, God did not hold back. He did not give you his second best. He did, not, he did not hand you the crumbs of heaven. He gave you his very best because he loves you. Because he loves you. Jesus came from heaven to earth. He lived, he died, he was buried and he rose again. Because he loves you. Which leads us into the two lessons of first fruits we've heard the truth that jesus is the fulfillment that the resurrection was not by accident but the feast also teaches us lessons it teaches us two lessons of how we should live in response to the truths that we have heard and the first lesson is this our god he gave us his best and we must give him our best in return. God gave us his best, and we must give God our best. In the Feast of First Fruits, Israel brought the first and the finest of their crops to the Lord. The first, the finest. They didn't bring those because our God was hungry. He is fulfilled perfectly. He needs nothing from no one. Uh, but they brought the first and the finest to him because they knew that everything they had was, be was because of him. Everything they had was from him. And they wanted to give their best back to him. They wanted to honor him. They wanted to love him by giving their best back to him. Now, in Jesus Christ, our God gave us the ultimate uh, the provision. He gave us the first fruits, the supreme, the ultimate and in return, God wants us, God wants us to give ourselves to him. God gave his son to us, and he wants us to give ourselves to him. Romans 6 verse 13 says it like this, far better than I ever could. Do not let any part of you become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves half-heartedly to know give yourselves completely to God for you were dead but now you have new life so use your whole body and remember that includes your mind and your heart your hands and your feet use it all as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God they say that children spell love T-I-M-E. That they spell it in time, T-I-M-E. And an old pastor once said to me that our, our Lord spells it the exact same way. God spells love T-I-M-E. Folks, we need to give God our time. There is, we live in a world, we live in an era where there is so much vying for our time and we need to fight and 
we need to prioritize and we need to choose and we need to give God our time. And I cannot express to you enough how worth it is, that it is when you do. You'll be amazed at the ensuing productivity and energy and joy and peace you receive when you give God the first and the finest of your time when you, when you choose to live as you were made and saved to live. We need to give him our time. We could even give him the first day of our week. We could even come to church every Sunday. Before the pandemic happened, st- statistically, church members came to church three out of four every month. Statistically now, the average church member comes to church one out of four every month. One out of four every month. And people say that they are tired. People say that they have more on, but statistically they worked out that we actually are participating in less every, every single week than we were before. We are out less. We are with people less. We are involved in less. We are working from home and traveling less. I think the enemy is involved in this. I think the enemy is wanting us to focus on ourselves, to focus on our tiredness, on our exhaustion, to focus on what uh, we want rather than what we need. Some, some of us even in this church have fallen into the terrible habit of attending church once or twice a month, prioritizing other activities over worship because, you know, our church will always be there. But we shouldn't, we shouldn't be like that. We shouldn't give God our seconds. We shouldn't give God our leftovers. His Bible says, not this pastor, his Bible says, and I just echo it, do not forsake the assembling of the church. Do not forsake the assembly of the believers, and yet we so often do. Friends, there is a reason that God wants you to begin your week in his presence with his people in worship under his word because it sets the course of the rest of your life. And the fact is, and you need to hear this, the fact is you are lacking without the the church and the church is lacking without you. You're lacking without us and we are lacking without you. And I don't say this because I want to moan at you. I've got no interest in that at all. But I want you to hear from the Lord that God is gently and lovingly reminding you to give him your first and your finest. And the first day of the week is not there by accident, but we are to prioritize him and his purposes for our lives. Whether that is what we watch on TV, how we spend our money, our energy, our time, what we say, what we speak about with others, God gets the first. The first option, the first choice is his and in light of him sharing with us his best i don't think it's too much to ask he is worthy he is worthy of it all so let us give him our all the resurrection of christ defines what we give to our god but not just that because it also defines and actually redefines why we give to our god so the first lesson is to give God our best the second lesson is that God has accepted you so worship him God has accepted you to worship him not worship him so he will accept you God has accepted you so worship him the priest in Israel would lift up and present the first fruits of the harvest to the Lord seeking his acceptance of it Jesus, though, is the reality. He is the ultimate first fruit. He was lifted up on the cross, presented to his Father, and God accepted his sacrifice. The payment for our sins was accepted. We have been made right with God. The work has been done for us because we couldn't. The Bible says our good works are like filthy rags. 
Nothing I could do, not enough charity work, not enough, not enough prayers, not enough programs, not enough church could get me accepted by God. I needed to be cleansed. I needed to be washed clean. And Jesus on the cross did that. And we know it was accepted because God didn't leave his son in the grave, but he rose him up. And the resurrection is the receipt of the payment made at the cross. It is the physical proof that the sacrifice pleased the Lord, that his work for us is good. And it is yes, and it is amen on our behalf. Meaning that all those who follow Jesus are ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven, and accepted by God. Which means, which means something's changed. Because Israel had to do something to be accepted by God. But we are already accepted. Why? Because of what Jesus has already done. We're already accepted. Which means Israel gave their best to God to earn his acceptance. But we give God our best because we're already accepted. Israel gave God their works to seek his favor. We give God our worship because he already favors us. Hallelujah. We do nothing to earn his love. We do everything because we already have his love. So we don't come to church every Sunday just because it's a Sunday and that's what Christians are supposed to do. That's that's not at all why we come to church. We come to church each week because he loves us and we love him and we love what he loves, his people and his presence. We don't sing and pray and read the word and fellowship with other people and Christians because that's what we should be doing, but we do it all because he loves us and we love him and we love what he loves, his truth and a growing intimate relationship with him. We do not prioritize and honor him in our time, energy, money, feelings, thoughts and words to earn his smile. We do it because he already loves us and we love him and we love what he loves ourselves did you know that did you know that god loves you and you should love you not in some kind of a self-obsessed way but you should love you and there is no more loving thing you can do for yourself than to give god yourself to surrender and to commit to him with your first and your finest just like jesus we have to die so that we can live He alone is worthy. Now, all that said, I don't want to stand here and be unrealistic because I know myself, you know yourself, and I have many days when I do not give God my best, my first and my finest. I give him the crumbs, the leftovers. And I have many of those days. All of us do, I'm sure. And if I'm honest with you, I hate it. I hate as I look back on my day on the hours and I just gave God the crumbs. I made choices which were, which were crummy. I spent hours which were crummy. I hate the fact that I wasted another day of not being all that I made and saved to be with him. But each time, each time I look back and I, re- I regret, each time that happens, God reminds me that he loves me and my sins are taken away. He forgives me. And through the resurrection, through Jesus, I can repent. I can change my mind. I can turn away from the wrong things and turn in the right direction and get on track with him. I can go from a day which was dead to a day which was alive. And the longer I have been fully committed to Jesus, friends, the longer I have spent time focusing on Jesus, the days of crumbs have become less and less. The days of crumbs have become less and last. And do you know why? Because I realized. I realized something amazing. I realized that the same power of God that rose Christ from the grave is in me. Oh, hallelujah. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave is in you. The resurrection power from Israel 2,000 years ago is in us today, right now. That's what the Bible tells us. That's what God promises. So if you want it because it's available to you, you can have that power to resurrect desires which are dead, decisions which are dead, hours which are dead, 
marriages which are dead, lifestyles which are dead, jobs which are dead, they can be resurrected. You can have power to rise out of bed in the morning. Hallelujah, I receive it. You can have power to be filled with confidence and boldness, power to love others. You can have power to worship, power to give God your best, power to not live in guilt and shame when you don't. Now, that power doesn't mean that God will pick up the word of God for you. It doesn't mean that he will love your wife for you. It doesn't mean that he will love your enemies for you. It doesn't mean he will put you in the car on the way to church for you. But it does mean that when you step out and choose to do those things, he will empower you as you do them. We are not like everyone else. The resurrection proves to us that we are not like everyone else. You have a power in you that is not in everyone else. One day, it is true, we said earlier, we will be resurrected physically and outwardly. But there is also another truth. You and I have been resurrected now inwardly and spiritually. The Bible says it like this. Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Which means... You're an overcomer. Because at the resurrection, God overcame death, overcame Satan, overcame sin. He overcame evil. He overcame sickness. He overcame poverty. He overcame famine. He overcame all that was wrong, all that was ugly. And that same resurrection power is in you. You're an overcomer. You will overcome when you walk and you talk and you live and you give your first and your finest with God overcomers are not lukewarm overcomers don't hand him the second best we give him our best in his power so our response to the resurrection how we should live in light of the feast of the first fruit is best articulated not by this pastor but by jesus himself when he said seek first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these other things in life and there's lots of them and many of them are good and great they will be added on to you. You will receive them. Give God your best. Let him handle all the rest. It's no secret that the church in the UK is infected with um, a terrible sickness of meh. Meh. To have a life of prayer, meh. To worship God, meh. To evangelize and see people lost, meh. Our God himself, meh. The church in the UK. Is struck with apathy. And uh, many of you have been brought over here to help that. And many of you have been have been placed here and born here since birth because God has a plan for you to help that. To see the church of God in the UK set on fire for him. And it, it is needed. It is needed because we live in a time where Christians uh, have no desire to seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. We live in a time where, where, where Christians are not obsessed with Jesus. They are not hungering and thirsting for a living, passionate relationship and life with him and to introduce him to others. We, they just, meh, ah, meh. Our Father who art in heaven, ah, meh. In Difference, indifference is the handmaiden of unbelief. Indifference is the handmaiden of unbelief. There's no place in Christianity, and the only cure to it is to look at the Savior outside of the empty tomb when he says to you, Good morning. Every day he looks at you and says to you, Good morning, because every morning with him is good, because the grave is empty. The tomb, the stone is rolled away. Jesus and you are alive. And so every morning with him is good. And we can fan that fire into flame. And we'll do whatever it takes to make that happen. Because he has made every morning a good morning 